P.T. Poppier with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And welcome to another episode of P.T. Pop, a mind revolution, where I lead you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. Today's show, I'm talking to Mike Williams. Mike Williams is a critical thinker and the host of the popular internet site, Sage of Quay Radio. He's also phenomenal and a gifted singer-songwriter, where you, you can actually find his music at laboroflovemusic.com. You can find his podcast at sageofquay.com. And most importantly, and why I invited Mike here today, is that he is a longtime and avid Beatles fan, and one of the leading Beatles conspiracy Paul is dead theorists in the world. Welcome to the show, Mike. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thanks for coming on. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Um, and thank you for subscribing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have been watching you. Am I too loud by chance? Because my... my uh, no, you sound fine. Hot. I've been watching you probably for two or three years. And I probably told you that when I was a kid, I, I, I think you're probably close to my age. I'm 57. And I discovered the Beatles when I was eight. Yeah. So that's 1974. There was a anniversary special of the... In February of 74, there's an anniversary special of the Beatles coming to America. And I was immediately obsessed. I don't know why, but the music just grabbed me and I became like a Beatle maniac immediately. And if, like a year later, I discovered the Paul is dead thing. And um, my brother, who's eight years older than me, he and I spent the better part of a summer in our basement playing the White Album backwards. Uh, yeah on reel to reel listening for hidden messages and looking at the Sgt. Pepper album cover and Abbey Road. And, you know, he was in college at the time and I'm this little kid and I, I just, I've always known about this, but your channel is the first one to make me really take it seriously before it was kind of a novelty. Yeah. And I have to admit that when I first saw your, now we don't have to just talk about Beatles and stuff, but um, but, but your channel was the first one that made me go, wow, the Beatles could have been a, just a, an organized boy band. Yeah. And it had never occurred to me. And there, as a musician myself, and I know you are too, um, the length of time it takes to write and record and do all the things that they allegedly did in such a short period of time. I never put those pieces together and went, oh. Well, they didn't have time to record and write and tour and go to photo shoots, you know. So when I first met, quote, met you or saw you online, I was devastated at first. I was like, whoa, I never thought about this. And I kind of got a little depressed because I really thought you were right. And I still I still think what you put together is just an amazing thing. And, and it's proof. I think I don't know if you can prove it prove it but your theory or or your perspective is pretty concrete so um you you you've you've brought me along and, and yeah. um it's very eye-opening so um what i was going to ask you is so how when did you discover the beatles how long have you been a beatles fan i go back to when i was 1968 i was nine years old because i'm 64 years old peter Oh, okay. I didn't realize you. Were, yeah, I'm 64, oh, and uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks to my wife and her cooking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I went to go see Yellow Submarine, so I was aware of the Beatles before the the film came out in 1968, yeah. and I kept bugging my my parents to uh, take me to the film. So my younger brother is 14 months younger than I am. And he was into the Beatles too. So the two of us are these two little Beatle freaks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so dad took us to uh, to go see Yellow Submarine. And I was very disappointed because uh, I didn't realize as a kid, it was an animation. And uh, so it's, it wasn't until the very end of the film that the Beatles came out. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I loved it. So, you know, for me, it was worth the price of admission just to watch the last, you know, four or five minutes of the film when they came out. Of course, my father was in total agony the whole time, you know, not, not dad's cup yeah. of tea. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's how I discovered it. And uh, I knew all about the uh, Paul is Dead going back into the 70s. Um, and I just looked at it as a marketing ploy to sell more records and mm -hmm. that the Beatles were always 
depicted as this clever, witty band. And they were just being clever and witty mm -hmm. with their fans. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, and it wasn't until I um, I got to 2016 and I stumbled upon the memoirs of Billy Shears. Hopefully the dogs, can you hear them? That's okay. Yeah, it's okay, fine. Okay, hopefully, hopefully they're yeah, quiet. I got that here. Yeah, yeah, that's... You know, so I, I bought the uh, the 2009 version. That's what was available in 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the red covered book without all of the footnotes and all that stuff. And uh, I just started digging into it because I didn't take the book, book at face value. There's a lot of noisemakers out there that say, I just ran with the book. And that's not true. I read the book. I investigated the book. I did the research. And, um, you know, and then I connected up with other researchers that well, were doing the same thing your research is just mind-blowing i mean to me you're the beatles of paul is dead conspiracy theorists if that makes sense and, and the amount of research you must have put into this i mean the dates the times the places you've drawn it all out on charts which is you know that's why i asked you for those charts because i'm like wow this guy really sat down and thought this through logically and there's other people that do this on YouTube, but they're nowhere near as eloquent or well thought out as you. By far, you, you've really um, put a huge amount of work into this. And well, what a lot of them do, Peter, is most of them they believe the they believe the official story, the Cinderella story, as to how the Beatles began, you know, mm -hmm. organic and all that stuff. And where they pick up the research is when Paul was replaced. And then they focus on Billy and they major on trying to prove to people that Billy is not Paul, mm -hmm. but they still want to protect and embrace the, the overall story. That's the biggest problem that a lot of these researchers, that's, that's the, that's how they stumble to be honest with you, because more and more people now are realizing with the way that the world is going in general, not just the Beatles, mm -hmm. that everything's a story. Yeah. Everything's a psychological operation. Everything's a narrative. Yeah. And and at this point in time in the game, for people to still believe in something like how the Beatles formed, the, the official narrative, they start to look a little dull because more and more people are waking up to the fact that that's that story is that story is mostly fiction. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? So anyway, but uh yeah, um, like I said, I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, Rubber Soul is a smoking gun. There's no okay. question about it, you know. Um, not just because of the 16 songs, but because of uh, the process to produce a record. Yeah, uh, let me pull up, the, I'll pull up that, that um, uh, the Rubber Soul graphic. So the way this came about, Peter, um, I was watching a DVD. It, uh, it's the series... Um, called Deconstructing the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And Scott Fryman is the uh, the author of that series. And Scott does a very good job uh, of presenting the series, but he's presenting the official narrative. So on a lark, I bought the DVD that talked about Rubber Soul. And I got about 15, 20 minutes into the storyline, which goes like this. The Beatles came into the Rubber Soul sessions on October 11th, and they came in with essentially no backlog of music. I, in fact, I think what Scott says in the DVD is that they came in pretty empty. So essentially, they had to write from scratch. So they had to write 14 songs for the album mm -hmm. and two songs for a double A-side single, which was Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out. Mm -hmm. So 16 songs total. Plus, they had to do a flexi disc uh, for um, for the fan club, and they also uh, received their MBEs during those recording sessions during that time frame, the thirty days from October eleventh to November eleventh. And they also stepped out of the studio to do a uh, a TV special, and that was two days. So it wasn't even thirty days contiguous. There were times when they, they you know they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in any case, so as I was watching the DVD and Scott's explaining how this all worked, um, how it came together and how it came down to the wire, being a, uh, a songwriter and a musician myself, I said, well, there's no way 
this could have worked. It's just, it's not possible to mm -hmm. come into the studio and say, hey, look, you know, you've got, you guys have got 30 days to, uh, you know, we're starting with a clean sheet and bang out 16 songs. And we're not talking about a lot of filler track. We're talking about 16 top shelf songs. Exactly. And um, so as I was watching it, I said, no, there's, there's something not right with this story. Because to write 16 songs within 30 days, that says that whatever John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison, Harrison touched, whatever song they started, they completed. In other words, there weren't any false starts, Peter, right? So, you know, as a songwriter, mm -hmm. you'll start mm -hmm. to write a song, you're trying to kick around some ideas, and you think to yourself, okay, well, that's not working. Yeah. And so you move to something else, right? Because songwriting mm -hmm. is a process. Oh, sure. Right. It's and it's and it can be a very time consuming process, especially when you're you're doing an album. So that's what set me off um, to go take a look at uh, what was really going on under the hood with Rubber Soul. And mm -hmm. so the whole thing with 16 songs in 30 days, uh, if you go and look at their schedule, uh, the official narrative tells us that they recorded four of the 16 songs on the very last day on November 11th, which mm -hmm. in itself is not a very believable uh, story. Now, aside from the 16 songs, the pro another problem that Rubber Soul had is that they finished up recording late in the evening, going into the early morning hours of November 12th, the Beatles did. And the lacquer, which is what is needed, the final lacquer, finalized lacquer, in this case, it was the, the mono lacquer, is used to press the records. And mm -hmm. that was not finalized until November 17th. And the Beatles and EMI had to have Rubber Soul in retail outlets on December 3rd. So the, this, the record had to be in stores on December 3rd in time for the Christmas season, because that's what they were shooting for. It was a, a record for the Christmas season. Big time for the record companies to make money. Mm -hmm. So the time between December, excuse me, November 17th and December 3rd is like two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And that itself is not possible. So the way the process works is once an artist or a band completes recording, Mm -hmm. Then there is an eight to 10, maybe even 12 week process to get the record out because you've got to get all the wheels in motion. Many times there are photo shoots. If the photo shoots hadn't been done already, you have to do the design and the layout of the album. You have to get the album printed. And back in the day, and they're still using four color printing today, but back in the day with four, four color printing, it took a week for the album covers or the slicks mm -hmm. to dry. Mm -hmm. Plus, you needed the names of the songs and you needed the sequence of the songs. Because on the back of Rubber Soul, like the back of just about any album, they're going to list the songs. Side A, these are the songs for side A, these are the songs for side B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the only way that the sequencing the only way that printing can be done is the sequencing has to be done. So in other words, George Martin needed the run times of the songs. And if they finished up four songs on the last day, November 11th, George Martin did not have the run times for those songs until the songs were done, until they were completed and any editing that would take place. Once you have all of the run times, that's how long the song Plays for folks, in case you're wondering what a runtime is. Then George Martin would sit down and he would sequence the album. He would look at the runtimes and he would decide which songs go in what sequence on side A and side B. And the reason why they do that is to make sure back in the day with vinyl records, you want the A side and B side to be balanced. When you you know when you're dealing with dead wax and all that stuff. Now, if the the, um, the official story tells us that George Martin completed the sequencing on November 16th, that's the day before 
the lacquer, the mm -hmm. final lacquer was cut. Well, here's the question. How did all the printing get done? How did the record covers, the slicks, the, the labels for the 33 and the 45 RPM records, the center labels, when did all that stuff get sent out to be printed? And how were they able to expedite it, let's say like within a week, mm -hmm. right? So the problem is that that couldn't have happened because when you send something out to get printed, print it's not just about printing, it's gotta be proofed. All of this stuff, everything's gotta be finalized. And here's the kicker. In order to press the records, now if the lacquer was finalized, the model lacquer finalized on November 17th, <laughs> That means that the actual pressing of the records started taking place right away. So it could have taken place on the 17th or November 18th. But in either case, in order to press the records, the final labels, the center labels for the records with the names of the songs in sequence had to be in-house and completed. Because when you press records, the label gets applied when the record gets pressed. It's not a process of pressing the record and then adhering the label to the record later on. They get done at the exact same time. The mm -hmm. wax gets pressed, the label gets pressed onto the center of the record, and that's how the record and the label come together. So that says in order for the records to start being pressed on either November 17th or the 18th, the labels with all the names of the songs and the sequencing had to be done well. If George Martin finished the sequencing on the 16th, how were the labels, the completed labels in-house yeah. on the 17th or the latest, the 18th, when they started pressing the records? The answer is, it couldn't have been. So then you have to ask yourself, well, then how did the labels get done? When were they done? So logically, you have to say, well, the songs were already known. Mm -hmm. The run times were already known. The names of the songs were already known. Mm -hmm. And the sequencing was done. And once you had those three elements, then the printing process for the labels and the jacket can begin. And what I what I did was I I backed it up and said, look, if it's a eight, 10, 12 week process, then the printing process the creation of the record jackets, the labels and all that stuff had to begin a lot earlier. Exactly. And it started before the Beatles entered into the studio on October 11th. And what I did, I used six weeks as mm -hmm. the, the cycle time for the process, Peter. And the reason why I did that was to give the official narrative the benefit of the doubt. This way I could say, look, I... Put six weeks out there, which means that EMI, they pulled out all the stops to make this work because it was the Beatles. And uh, But in reality, in the real world, when you're doing a record, eight, 10, 12 weeks out after you conclude recording, mm -hmm. and that's the process going forward. And, you know, maybe two months later or two and a half months later, your record will be out and packaged so that was a big problem with the narrative yeah um a big problem so what they were able to do was they were able to get the initial batch of records out to the stores on december 3rd um and then continue to press after december 3rd obviously to get more and more records into the stores but that's a in in my opinion that is a smoking gun and yeah, I've and had I've had people from the record industry, from the music industry, communicate with me and say, "You're right, you're right." Yeah, and and I think if we back up, because we we've jumped into 1965, but I think I don't know how much we can get into Tavistock and yeah, all that stuff. But this is how I take your this is my interpretation of your take, or or this is my interpretation of what I think happened. There's four guys in a band that you know, the story goes, Brian Epstein just stumbles upon him because somebody bought a record in his record shop and he's so taken by him. He, he busts his butt to get him a recording contract. But, but I think what the, 
what we're theorizing or you're theorizing is that there are forces behind the scene that saw them as a potential tool to market a change in youth and culture and things like that. And they thought that they might be good puppets. Am, am I off? Am I, am I on the right track? So they, so they saw these four guys that had charisma that were rough. They felt they could polish them up, write some songs for them, prop them up there as a boy band and market them to the world to try to make money and push an agenda. Yeah. Um, and, I, and that's very, very 50,000 foot overview of what, what, you're you're theorizing correct yeah so the official story tells us that the beatles um were these four guys from liverpool and they connected with brian epstein who was a record store owner and then Mm. he eventually gets them a record deal with emi under the tutelage of george martin and um then they go on to unparalleled fame and fortune that's what I refer to as the Cinderella, Cinderella story. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't work that way. In order to have that type of trajectory, you have to have a machine behind you. So my argument has been that the Beatles were not organic. They were never organic. They were always managed. And they were engineered to become what they become for the purposes of social engineering. Correct. Under the umbrella of the Tavistock Institute. Now, for those of you that don't know who Tavistock is, Tavistock is, it's, they're based in the UK, in London. They tuck in under the Committee of 300, and they are essentially responsible for all of the psychological operations, the conditioning, brainwashing, and social engineering throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people, Peter, they have a hard time grabbing onto this because you know they still think that these internationalist structures really don't exist. They just they really maybe exist in name only, but a lot of people think they have mm-hmm. just a limited um, level of um, of involvement in society and in the culture. When in fact, they are running our society and determining what our culture is going to be as an example in the United States we our culture really is pop culture which is Mo, yeah which is you know it's it's tv it's movies it's fast food that's that's what the united states has become pop culture and that is through the work of tavistock so what the controllers wanted to do was to move everything to a, a completely different landscape mm-hmm. from a societal and cultural perspective they they said, we're going to move away from traditional values. We're going to um, break down institutionalized religion, specifically Christianity. They they had Christianity was a big blip on their radar. Mm -hmm. They had to get rid of it. And people might be asking, well, why did they do that? Because they're looking to go to a completely different age. It's referred to by Alistair, uh, Alistair Crowley as the eon of Horus, and that is the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from the age of Pisces, or the eon of uh, Osiris, in in Crowley's terms, to the new age. And it's an age of of paganism. It's an age, um, we can refer to it as the age um, the cult of Dionysus, the cult of Pan. Mm -hmm. It's, It's it's a a lifestyle. It's a way of living where anything goes. If it feels good, do it. Exactly. That's where they're going with this. And in order to get there, they had to break down the old structures. And what I've been telling my audience for a very long time is the people that run the world, they are occultists. Your presidents and your prime ministers, they're cutouts. They're actors. They're performers. And they get replaced every four years, whatever. Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. They're disposable. They're there uh, for the gullible public to believe that that's their leadership. Mm-hmm. But there is a deep state, a very, very deep state that is behind the curtain. The Wizard of Oz is behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. And um, 
this is where they're going with everything. So, and because they're occultists, Peter, a part of a of occultism is alchemy. And we're going through an alchemical process now where they are tearing down the old ways, the old structures that we were interacting with and, and living with so that they can move to their, their new age or the eon of Horus. You know, it's, it's funny as it, it, this might be more understandable to, as you get older, because when I was younger, I wouldn't have listened to you. I would. Oh no, you could. You can't talk to me about the, the Beatles. No, no, no. They're they're yeah. real, and they're four geniuses. And I think to myself, wait a minute. Four. Now my dog. My dog is barking. But you know, you mean to tell me that four guys just happen to make a band, and they just happen to be well, three of them are geniuses. I don't know about Ringo, and they all write amazing songs, and they're all amazing musicians. And they're all, you know, as I've gotten older, I'm like, hold on a second. This has never been duplicated for a reason. And and I don't remember, I don't know when you first heard the Star Club album, but I was probably sixth grade when I heard the Star Club. Years ago, yeah. And I'm like, what is this? As a kid, I'm like, this is horrible. Uh, who, whoever could hear this band and go, yeah, the this is the next, you know, this is the next thing we got to sign a recording contract. Granted, it could have been an off, off night whenever that was recorded. Uh, you know, nobody's applauding in the audience. They sound horrible. It's there's some charisma there. There's some life and some energy musicianship, but I didn't hear anything special as a kid. You know, when you're a kid, you're kind of unfiltered and you're just, you, you say things you shouldn't. And I was like, Oh, this is crap. So, so somebody heard these horrible, this horrible band playing Bessie Mimucho in, in this terrible bar. And they went, yeah, they're the next thing. So, so I think, like you said, there's something either that was a platform they were using to kind of groom them. Yes. And these bars in Germany and England and to get them to the next stage so they could put them in Shea Stadium or at the Palladium or so they're more polished. Is is am I kind of on the right track there with that? Yeah. Yeah. So the Beatles were a bar and club band. That's what they were. Yeah. Okay. So when you listen to the old, you know, uh recordings from Germany, that's what you're hearing, a bar and club band. It's not knocking them. It's just that's what they were. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they, they did these, these long stints in Germany, and then they had this, uh, this, this constant uh, live gigging throughout um, locally near Liverpool and throughout the UK that went on from 1961 through 1963. And then in 1964, they, um, they wind up in the United States. But the reason why they were doing all of these live performances uh, Peter is because they were being they were being groomed. It was mm -hmm. boot camp mm -hmm. to get their chops to the point where they could be taught the songs, the Beatles songs. They would be taught them how to play them, and then take them out on the road. The the Beatles are were the veneer for the music. Exactly. Yeah. They they took it out on on the road and. Um, so that's what was going on. That's why they were doing all that playing. Like when they were in Germany, they were playing seven hours a night. I have a recording of an interview with Pete Best when Pete was with the band going back to, to um, Hamburg. And he said that they would play you know, seven, eight hours a night. And then once they got done playing, I don't know whether they went, you know, they stuck around to go drinking or whatever, but he said they would wake up at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's when they got up and they was, they were staying in some old cinema. I mean, the, the conditions were, were horrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they wake up at three o'clock and Pete said they had to be back at the clubs by 6 PM. So they had a three hour window between waking up and getting to the club to do another seven or eight hours of playing. So that's what Germany was like, especially in the early days. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at their schedule throughout um, uh, locally, like I said, in Liverpool and the UK from 61 to 1963, they were playing constantly, virtually every night. I mean, they had a couple of nights where they didn't play, but uh, I have this, uh, I have the link. You can find it on Wikipedia. It actually has their performance schedule and you can take a look at it. It was just, they just kept going, 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 going. 
And that was, again, that was to build their skills. That was to build their chops, not as songwriters, because Tavistock already had their songwriters. It was to build their skills to be able to be quick studies and to learn the songs that they were taught and then to take them out on the road mm -hmm. to push the whole psychological operation, the whole social engineering initiative known as the Beatles or Beatlemania. Um, as you as you know, I argue that the Beatles between 1962 and 1966, I don't think they wrote anything. And I don't believe they played on any of the recorded tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. There you God, go. This this is wild. Yeah, so take a look at that. I mean, they're, they're virtually playing almost every single night. Right. So if you keep going, you're going to 1962, 1963. Wow. Yeah, see, so they're in Hamburg. Oh, they're all in Hamburg. This is all the top 10 club. and Yes. Wow. Okay. We're still going. Geez, that's right. a lot of gigs. Yes. And that's right. pretty fortunate. I mean, I don't know if you were a, a gigging musician. I did it. You know, I had a solo act. And it's it was so hard for me to get a gig, just one or two gigs a summer. Yeah. And granted, I'm not the Beatles or whatever they were. But how did these guys get so many gigs? Well, that's the thing. That's the question you have to ask yourself. So that gets back to there has to be a machine behind them. Yeah. So all of these gigs, folks, that Peter is showing you, this was to get them up to speed. This was to get their the skill level up on their instruments enough so that they could be taught songs and take them out on the road. Mm -hmm. And we and that, have to also yeah. differentiate between Musician skills that that will cut it playing live versus skill level uh, that is required in the studio. Mm -hmm. So the Beatles were not session players. They didn't have that level of skill. They weren't session musician skilled musicians. So um, and, you know, and and this is not something that I've I've made up. I mean, we the Beatles themselves, you know, John Lennon, has said that uh, you know he was not all that happy with his own guitar playing. That in fact, in one interview, he said that he was he was somewhat embarrassed about his level of guitar playing. We have George Harrison saying that he never practiced. He and Ringo never practiced. You know, um, we have Billy telling. Um, uh, Bernie Goldberg in an interview, I think it was going back to the 1980s, that George Harrison was was missing in action. He was absent for the most part for their Sergeant Pepper sessions. Mm -hmm. Right. So if if George wasn't really there, if he wasn't, Billy said he was putting a pool in or something. If I can interrupt real quick, then you can tell yeah. everybody who Billy is. Because okay, so, some people might not know who Billy is. Okay. So the person, Paul McCartney was replaced back in 1966 and late 66 some people will use august 66 others will say it was september others will say it's november mm -hmm. in the book the memoirs of billy shears uh, let me see if i can get it here yeah i got it here you got it okay. it's, it's, it's your blue screen yeah it? the screen yeah that's that's the book that peter's holding up that book tells us that the date was september 11th 1966 september 11th is a very occulted date folks yeah yeah very occulted it September 11th is considered a day of war and it, it doesn't does not necessarily mean physical war it could also refer to psychological warfare or psychological operations but in either case whether paul passed in august september or november he was replaced by a person that goes by the name of billy shears in the book he tells us his name is william shepherd some people believe his surname is campbell and i i just stay away from that peter because it gets into a kind of a senseless debate. Is it Shepard mm -hmm. or is it Campbell? I just go by what he has on the book, Billy Shears. It's just a lot easier. And that's how he refers to himself. That's kind of his his alias. And so, um, you know, Billy, he joined the band uh, externally from a public perspective with the release of Sgt. Pepper. And Sgt. Pepper was his album. It was his baby. And it was he and George Martin that were that put it together and uh, so billy was the driving force but i also believe that billy was in the background with the beatles machine prior to 
the release of Sergeant Pepper. I believe that he was, he goes back perhaps all the way back to 1962. And it's very possible that he was one of the ghost writers for the Beatles during that period. And also one of the session players that were, that was on the recorded tracks. Um, because uh, again, so in case your, your audience doesn't know, I mentioned that uh, I my argument is the Beatles were not on the recorded tracks between 1962 and 1966. That means session players. Mm -hmm. George Martin hired session players, musicians to play on those tracks. And who are some of those musicians? Well, we can only take a guess, right? We know that Andy White was hired to drum on P.S. I Love You and Love Me Do. Bernard mm -hmm. Purdy has come out since yep. the late 70s to say that he drummed on 21 Beatle tracks. Uh, Vic Flick was a great guitar player, was in the George Martin Orchestra. It's very likely that Vic was one of the, um, the session guitarists on, on Beatle tracks. He is the guitarist that you hear uh, playing guitar on Ringo's theme in A Hard Day's Night and on the um, yes. United Artists release of the instrumental, Help. The instrumentals. The instrumentals. That was yep. Vic Flick. Uh, Big Jim Sullivan. And Big Jim was uh, very well versed on the sitar. So I believe it's uh, Big Jim that was playing sitar on Norwegian wood. I was contacted by a relative of Ronnie Verrill, the great jazz session musician out of the UK. Ronnie's been dead now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But his relative told me that Ronnie drummed on Beatle tracks as well. Wow. And I have a clip of uh, Glenn Campbell introducing Cream um, in 1968 and saying that they were studio musicians, they formed their own band, and they played on um, they, they played on tracks for the Beatles, and he mentioned a couple of other bands. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, right? Because, you know, Eric Clapton played lead guitar on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Mm -hmm. I have, I have um, surmised that I believe it's also Eric playing the lead guitar on Old Brown Shoe. That sounds like Eric to me. That sounds like Eric Strat playing on that song. And uh, people have asked me, because Bernard Purdy in a 2004 interview said that there were four be four drummers on, on the Beatle records between 62 and 66, and Ringo was not one of them. That's a direct quote from Bernard Purdy. And, and Bernard is one of the most recorded uh, drummers of all time. And he's a, a great, great studio player. He's still alive today. He's in his 80s. So the question becomes, well, who were the four? Well, we know Andy White. That's the official narrative. We know Bernard says that he drummed on 21. I had uh, uh, one of Ronnie Verrill's family members contact me and say Ronnie was one of their drummers. That's three. And then with the Glenn Campbell clip, I'm thinking, well, was Ginger Baker? Ah. Maybe it was Ginger Baker. So uh, it could be Hal Blaine from, from the, uh, the Wrecking Crew. And some might argue, well, why would the Wrecking Crew, which was American-based, be involved in Beatle records. Well, what a lot of people don't know is those tapes, they made their way across the pond to get this music done. And in, in fact, Bernard said that when he did the uh, the recording of the 21 tracks that he drummed on for the Beatles, the tapes were sent over to Capitol in New York. That's where he did the drumming, in the Capitol, Capitol Studios in New York, not over in... in uh, london or the uk mm -hmm. so it's uh it's a crazy story it really is yeah um it really is i don't want to get you derailed here peter i know we're short on time so no, no. the questions you have no i think it's fascinating because as i said you know, i'm not trying to put them down but as a musician myself when i hear them play there's no way that these guys could play as precisely as they sound on whatever meet the beatles with the beatles all, all that musicianship is precise and crisp and clean and they did it supposedly in a couple of takes and the song was done. And and you and I both know you sit down in the studio and somebody gets paranoid and they forget where to come in. And so so these guys were just so brilliant. They just sat down behind their mics and their guitars and they just knocked off Day Tripper in a couple of takes. And that was it. I mean, I just there's not a chance in the world I believe that. No, especially and especially when they're high in pot and whatever else they started taking in, in the mid 60s. There's no way. And, and this is where I start. I started thinking, you know, after I got the initial shock of your first presentation, I saw I went, wow, maybe this guy is right. Because, you know, just from from a creative perspective, these have to be the four luckiest 
artists of all time that, that just fell into this sweet gig. So this leads me to another question. So do you think that at some point the Beatles, they presented something to the Beatles and made it seem like they were going to be the next whatever. And the, the four guys weren't aware that they were part of this Tavistock thing. And that maybe they thought they, they built them up to make them think they were all that in a bag of chips. And they weren't aware that they're kind of being duped. They said, we're going to write the songs for you. We're going to put you up on stage. And then I, this is my theory. I think they started doing heavier drugs when they realized they were stuck in kind of this deal with the devil. Yeah. Literally and figuratively like John Lennon, I think he starts shooting up because he's like, I can't take this anymore because I thought I was going to be a rock star. And if this is what it is, I'm done. And, and I think he wanted out. That's just total theory on my part. But what do you think that they were aware of it? Or do you think they got duped into being the Beatles? I, th I think they were, they were certainly aware that they were being deceptive, but I don't believe they understood the full magnitude of why mm -hmm. the deception was in play. So they had their role and that's all they had. They had a role. So some people would say, oh, you know, um, they didn't know. I said, well, you know what? I, I, they didn't know the full picture, but they did know that they weren't writing the music. And they did know that they weren't on the recorded tracks, especially between 62 and 66. From 67 to 70, George Harrison and John Lennon played on more of the, um, of the recorded tracks and contributed to the, uh, the song content. Uh, mm -hmm. But they were still using studio players and ghostwriters from 67 to 1970. That's that's what I've deducted. So to answer your question, Peter, um, they didn't know the full breadth of what it is they were really involved in. I mean, we're talking about a, a major league psychological operation. We're talking about it's it's gigantic. Okay, It's, well, it's a gigantic psyop. What I've noticed, and, and even as a kid, I always refer back to when I was a kid, because you kind of hear things in a pure form. When I heard the White Album for the first time, I'm like, this is the Beatles? Right. I mean, it, it just, it sounded like sloppy to me compared to Sgt. Pepper's. It sounded sloppy and loose, like they were really playing on it. For the first time, I think the White Album, you're starting to hear them really play as a as a band. Yeah. And then, I don't know, but Let It Be is pretty sloppy. And Abbey Road, I think they polished that up pretty good. But what do you think? I mean, that, that's I just think that with the White Album is this. Some of it is really loose. I think. Yeah, the White Album sounds like it sounds like a, a, a solo album by four different people that was put together. That's how I yeah. got it, right. Yeah, they all went off in different directions, and they said, "Okay, here's my song, and here's mine." And they stuck it together. But like I said, not all of those songs were written by them or um, it was them on the recorded tracks. Um, okay. an, an example of the White Album where I I, I use as an example where um, to say a Beatle wrote that song, but a ghostwriter wrote this one is the song Piggies. So we have Long, 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 which is a George Harrison composition. And I believe George wrote that song. I mean, it's a very slow plotting song. It's not difficult. Is it possible that George wrote that song? Yes. Piggies? No. All of a sudden, we have this classical Baroque uh, uh, composition with lyrics that are right up Theodore Dorno's alley, who is a social scientist with Tavistock. So Piggies is a song that was written, credited to George Harrison. George sang it, obviously, but he didn't write the lyrics. And he didn't write the music to Piggies. That yeah. was written by uh, another composer who who could write classical Baroque types of music. Uh, another lyricist who put the words together that mirrored uh, the social science mentality mindset uh, of Tavistock and Stanford Research Institute going back in the day and even today. So um, that's an example. And I, I agree with you that the White Album wasn't as tight as Sgt. Pepper. 
And, uh, you know, Pepper was really, uh, uh, Billy held very tight reins on on the mm -hmm. Pepper album. I mentioned before that George Harrison was pretty much absent, although he's credited for playing uh, guitar tracks on that on, on the Pepper record. And mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves, well, if George wasn't there, then who were, who was the guitarist on those songs? Um, that was Billy's baby, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and then we have to also ask ourselves when we go back to the early period, like 62 to 66, think through it, folks. Where is, where are the songs like in my life during the solo career? Where, where are those songs? Mm -hmm. Think back to those songs and think about the the just the how brilliant they were, the you know the lyrics, the music, and all of that dissipates. It just completely goes away, mm -hmm. especially when they go solo. In fact, I would argue that once sixty seven turned around, uh, we got into nineteen sixty seven through nineteen seventy, we don't hear that style of music pretty much anymore either. The sixty two to sixty six period kind of stands by itself. 67 to 70, we get more into the uh, the psychedelic um, stuff, but, you know, but it's still good. But sure. then once we get into the solo period, all of a sudden, this, uh, this, this songwriting prowess that we, we were told is the Beatles mm -hmm. falls off the cliff. Now, and that's it, not to say yeah. that there weren't some, some good songs in the solo. Sure years but i mean when we're we're talking about pound for pound when we we take a look at both periods it, in my view there's no comparison i don't know how you feel about it well no i think the john especially john lennon's music after the split is just garbage i i just i can't stand most of the stuff he released and not all of it but you know like sometime in new york city and it's horrible i hate that album it's just yes. terrible and people these Beatle maniacs, like I used to go, oh, it's, it's, it's a stroke of genius. And no. I, I, some of the stuff off of number nine dream and, and, uh, you know, imagine's a great song, but I wonder how did he pull this song? Imagine out of his backside and the rest of the album is kind of crap. I well, mean, where did that that tells from? us he didn't write, he didn't write imagine it was, it was credited to him. Yeah. So, you know, imagine is the anthem of the new world order. Imagine no possessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's no different than what Klaus Schwab is telling everybody. You'll own nothing, You'll own nothing and be nothing happy. Yeah, be happy. Yeah, it's the same thing. Well, but well, you know, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say. So, um, on another, I'm going to kind of on a parallel. Have you noticed how music affects you um, mentally? Because I, I, I didn't really tune into this until I was older. But there's an album by Crosby, Stills and Nash. That album called Just Crosby, Stills and Nash. I'd never heard the whole album. I bought it a couple of years ago, digital format, put it on my speakers here. And I went into a trance and I don't do drugs. I don't drink anymore. And I would go into this like trance, this listening to this music. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? What is, what, what is in this music that is putting me in this frame of mind, like this very peaceful, uh, bliss like state, not mm -hmm. quite bliss. And, and I wonder, do you believe there's something hidden in the in the mastering of the music that is kind of like the pied piper that's kind of putting the kids or the people into a trance and i know this sounds really paranoid but i'm telling you i can't listen to music from my childhood anymore because the stuff that i thought was a love song when i was a little kid now i hear the lyrics and it's about heartache it's about breakup it's not about love yeah but it's, it's called a love song so do you think there's something in the music in the music industry that is I don't know, for lack of a better word, hypnotizing the yeah. youth. Yeah, I think that's um well, Alan Watt, not Alan Watt, the musician and the Alan Watt that did social commentary. Um oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he in my presentation, the addendum, which I released back in April, which is the follow-up to my April 2020 presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music? I have a clip from Alan at the very end of that presentation. And he he states that George Martin was a sound engineer, and he didn't mean like the sound engineer in the booth. He meant a sound engineer in terms of how sound and frequency yes. affects the mind. Yes. So that that's definitely in play. Um, 
it's funny. I had an interview with uh, Kat from the from the uh, Supernatural Beatles channel, and uh, it was it was amazing because she said that when she hears music, she's listening to Beatle music, she will see colors, and the same thing happened to me, especially with psychedelic um, music. So I listen to Pepper, and whenever I listen to Sergeant Pepper, I, I get this whole like essence of colors all around me, Peter. Star Graving Sober, you get this, right? Just just listening to it straight. Yes, yes, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah, I'm not yeah. stoned or anything, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, just listening to it. So there's definitely something within the music that is eliciting, that's touching on us psychologically. And uh, yeah. for, for some people, you know, they might get what I got, colors. Others might trance out. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, there's an effect that's, that's built into the music. Now, others have said, uh, I think it's uh, John Todd did some, um, he was going back a number of years ago and he was, uh, he claimed to be a former Satanist and then he became a Christian. And he was saying that um, there was all kinds of uh, satanic ritual around the music where they actually would have a ritual uh, conducted before the album was released. In other words, baked into the master tape. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just putting that out there. But the point sure. I'm trying to make is that we have all these different elements that are baked into the cake. And there's a reason why music is, um, is so important to the controllers. It's one of the, the biggest tools in their toolbox because they know through music they can manipulate. Exactly. And if it's not just through the genre of music, then it's going to be through the words. It's going to be through, um, well, the genre would be the type of music. It would be um, the way the, the band is presented, the way they dress, the way they speak, the album covers with all of their symbolism on it. Mm -hmm. Some people have asked me, well, you, are you saying every band is in on this thing? I said, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is once you sign on the dotted line and you're with these record labels, the record labels are connected into the machine. I hate mm -hmm. to break it to you, but yeah, oh yeah. You know, well, same with movie, the movie industry movies, and everything else. Yeah. Exactly. So what's going to happen is um they're going to package you in a way that's going to get their agenda mm -hmm. pushed forward. You might not even be aware of the agenda. They don't care whether you know or not. Yeah. All they care about is getting their message out and they they do it through signs and symbols and uh through frequency mm -hmm. you know so to answer your question yes there's definitely something that they're able to to do with the music um multifaceted i would assume that has that effect on us and, and i also think that for those of us that aspire to be famous musicians like i had that delusion i was younger i think the the movie industry the music industry whatever the entertainment industry you're trying to get into certain people have been picked and pre it's been predestined that they're going to be the next whatever so guys yes. like you and me that try to do it we really don't have a chance even if we've got all the talent in the world because we don't fit the mold it's not about talent it's not about music it's about the machine behind it right. so i think they get all of us chasing after these dreams, these unicorns that aren't achievable. And the chances of us ever getting any type of traction is probably almost impossible because they've already got an idea. They've got people in place, I guess what I'm saying. So so they've got us chasing our tails. Right. Trying to become the next artist that's the next craze. Even some of these YouTube channels. I'm like, how do these guys get 50 million followers? They're just... You know, I mean, I, I, I read into everything now. They're plugged in, Peter. They're, yeah, they, yeah. They're plugged in. And uh, you're exactly right. You and I, see, they dupe us into believing that everybody has a shot at this. Yeah. It's the same thing they did with the with the kids in the inner city and, and telling them, don't go to school, play basketball. Yes. Because you could be like Michael Jordan. In the meantime, the kid's playing basketball and his entire education goes away because he was on a court playing basketball with his friends. And then, you know, he winds up being 18, 19, 20 years old and he's going nowhere fast. Exactly. 
So yeah. they have us spinning our wheels. That's what they, it's just a big story. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's an illusion to make you believe that this is possible. It's not possible. And I broke it down to three tiers. There are those that are bloodlined into the pyramid of power, and they are tapped very early in life to be placed in very influential positions, whether it be in music or entertainment or politics, mm -hmm. the media, whatever. Then you've got those that maybe are not bloodlined, but they're in secret societies. So they're good because there's a very, very high odds that they're going to follow through on whatever the agenda is, and they're rewarded handsomely. That's the thing you have to understand, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're rewarded handsomely. And then you got a third tier, which are those artists or entertainers, musicians that are not bloodlined, they're not in secret societies, but they are pulled in by the machine and they are used and abused in order to move the agenda forward. Exactly. So for those people who may have just been discovering this, what is the solution to people that might be shocked by this, think we're crazy i mean what's the solution what so because so, now when i go we went to see the new indiana jones movie yesterday and and i'm sitting there watching like what's the point of this movie what, what's the message they're trying to get out other than good versus evil um and, and i read into everything now everything is a scheme and it sounds paranoid but everything has an agenda behind it yes to sell something it's all about selling and getting control of you so where do people turn i mean i've heard other people say there's a comedian named Jim Brewer. Brewer yeah, Jim Brewer, Brewer, yeah. He, you know, he he's turned to Christ, but I don't want to be a Bible thumb. I'm a Christian, but it seems like Christ is really one of the answers. But where do people go? What do you think people should look to if it's not social media and the, the world of entertainment? What I tell people, Peter, is to invest in yourself, mm -hmm. which means... See, when you go outside of yourself, when you're worshiping these bands and these artists and these entertainers and these politicians and these Silicon Valley icons, mm -hmm. when you're doing that, you are disempowering yourself and you are taking your authority and you're handing it over to somebody else. And so now you have no authority and you're, you're disempowered and you're following. I tell people, stop following, lead, lead. You can start by leading your own life. And stop focusing on these people because, as you said, as difficult as it is to believe, for, for many people to believe, it is one gigantic agenda and they are marching humanity in a direction and they're going to push most of us off a cliff. Mm -hmm. That's where this is going. And for people that don't understand this, you really, really have to try to get a handle on this. Take a look around you. All the dysfunction that you see that's going around, mm -hmm. it's not coincidence. It's not just happening. It's not just pockets of stuff that are happening. Oh, what's going on with the world? The whole world seems to be breaking down. The whole world is breaking down. And yeah. the reason why it's breaking down is because there is a master plan, there's a master strategy in place by the controllers, by the internationalist structure. Some people call them globalists, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, whatever name you want to give them. They're a cultist yeah. and they're breaking things down. I spoke earlier about because they're a cultist, they use a process of alchemy to take down the structures, the old structures, so that they can bring in the new. And what they have planned, you know, most people are probably not going to be happy about it. So my answer is go within, invest in yourself. Knowledge is truly power. It really is. Get yourself educated on how this world really works. Forget about what the politicians are telling you. They're lying to you. Mm -hmm. your, your prime ministers are lying to you. They're all lying to you. Everything is everything is, is a big game to them. And it's it's everything is strategically in place. And they move things on a chessboard like you're just a pawn on the chess on the chessboard. That's how they, oh, they yeah. view us. Yeah, and we, the, we we have to stop being pawns. Yeah, I think you made a great point. And one thing I say in my podcast is all we have is each other. Yeah, and they want to divide us and separate us all. 
but like just here in my street, you know, the neighbor's dog died or, um, you know, we all kind of know each other and we were kind of, we don't, you know, it's not, not, not a, a clan, but we, we feel for each other and we communicate um, even during the pandemic. But other people in the same neighborhood, you'd see them on the street. And if you didn't have your mask on, they literally run into the street to get away from you. I'm like, no, we've right. got to stop doing that to each other. Like um, this whole black versus white and gay versus straight. And they've got everybody hating and wondering and paranoid. Why don't we just embrace each other and, and turn away from, do I need a new Toyota? Do I need a new, well, I should talk. I'm surrounded by cameras and lights and stuff, but. You know, I've bought into some of the, you know, I just, I just released a movie last November, a documentary, and I'm like, oh, should I put it in the film festival circuit? But if I do that, once I do that, it gets, it's, I'm hostage to the film festivals because I can't release it anywhere else. I can't put it on YouTube. Yeah. But I did, I put it out there and it's been sitting there for months waiting to hear responses from these film festivals if they want to accept it in their festival. I'm like, why am I doing this? I won't make any money from it. And the people that really need to get to see it won't get to see it. So yeah. I kind of I kind of still am waiting in, in the in the filth, I guess, hoping I get some type of recognition. But I, I don't think it's possible unless you have connections or you like you said, you're tied into the to the machine. Yeah, you have to be tied into it. And um I, I understand what you're saying. Um for me, I, I just got to the point. Peter, maybe it's because of my age where I, I just, I have detached from all of that stuff. And when I put like my music out there, I, I put it out there and I think to myself, okay, well, hopefully people will hear it. I'll do the best I can to try to promote it. Um, but it's out there. Yeah, yeah, I want to say, I like your music. I listened to Billy Pepper. Oh, yeah. I, I really like that song. And, uh, Oh, you've got, uh, if you want to listen to Mike's music, I put the, I pre-recorded an intro about your music on laborofloveMusic.com. Yeah. And also if you want to uh, go to Mike's website, it's Sage of Quay Radio. And uh, Sage of Quay.com. Oh, is it Sage of Quay.com? I'm sorry. Sage of Quay.com. That's okay. Yeah. 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 And you can find Mike on YouTube. Just look for Mike Williams or look for Sage of Quay. Well, that's one thing I want to ask you. And I know we're a little over, but. Where did you come up with Sage of Quay? I've always wondered what that means. What is that? Uh, well, it is a, a town uh, that I live in, and uh, and it's it's a part of the the, the name of the town, and uh, it's actually an abbreviation, Quay. Oh. And um, this go, this goes back years ago, Peter. Years ago, mm -hmm. and when I I started off as a blogger, I started off blogging in like 2011. I I, I still run my blog. I still mm -hmm. do it every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was putting up all of this conspiracy research, alternative research stuff on the blog. And uh, so my family uh, started joking around with me and they started saying, oh, it's the sage, because I would be talking to them about what's ah. really going on in the world. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So and uh, so I just combined, you know, the two words. And uh, and for the <laughs> longest time, I, I for the longest time, I, I didn't even like it. And uh, I'm not even sure. I. I'm not even sure today I still like it, but it, it's just, it's stuck. And so, you know, so since it's stuck, I, I still go with it. Um, it. It works. It sounds mystical or something. It sounds like I was, is this a Beatles term? What is, I kept trying to no. find it. <laughs> I'm researching it. I'm reading into it. I'm like, this is something that they, uh, not the paparazzi. Um, oh man. I can't think of the, my mind's gone blank. The, um, that's okay. Masons. Is it a Masonic thing or? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I'm not a, by the way, I'm not a Mason. Yeah. I'm not no, in the Illuminati. Right. I don't work with Tom <laughs> Harriet, who's the author of the book. Yeah. I, I've heard people accuse you of that. Oh my God. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I, I don't work for Billy. None of that stuff. You know what the problem is, Peter? A lot of times it's because if somebody can, you know, put some charts together and they can articulate what they've put together, people automatically you know, they, not everybody, but there is that segment out there that thinks that somehow you're plugged in or you're working for somebody or, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's just, it's nonsensical. And uh, to, these days, you know, I, I just get a chuckle out of it. Well, I think, and I'm back in a Beatles thought here, is that I think it's funny that they portrayed the Beatles as these really nice guys 
just wholesome guys that when they're on tour in the United States and around the world, they were just holed up in hotel rooms, right. 22, 23 year old men. And when I was 22, the only thing I could think about was getting laid. Yeah. And that, you know, that's what we all did. We went, you know, went to college and we looked, for, you know, and being Drinking. Blunt, all of that stuff. You So you mean to tell me that these four guys didn't have girls brought to the room. They didn't have hookers. They, they, they just did. drank their rum and Cokes and they sat there and watched TV. And then, and then when Ron Howard released that ridiculous eight days a week, I was like, this is such crap. There's, there's no way, especially if John Lennon is, is the masculine macho guy he was, there's no way he sat in that room. No, no. And look, Lennon in an interview said, uh, it was printed in the independent going back about three years ago. He said on the, the set of, uh, the film help, he said they were in a haze of marijuana. Yeah. They were smoking weed all day long. Oh, and yeah. they he said that they were useless by around noon. Mm -hmm. They couldn't no, really. Yeah. Richard Lesser really couldn't do any more filming because they were just out of it. So you got to ask yeah, yourself, yeah. I mean, yeah. OK, so. Like you said, that's what young guys do, especially when they have celebrity behind them and they've got oh, some yeah. money behind them. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, the whole thing where people were thinking that they were writing music on the set of help, that they weren't writing music on the set of help. They were smoking <laughs> weed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've been around guys that are stoned 24 seven and they're, they're useless. And yeah, it's, it's just, uh, so, so the myth, I mean, John Lennon talks about the myth of the Beatles and I think he, he, he drops hints mm -hmm. in his solar career about it being over and that the myth was, is gone. And, uh, I think he kind of woke up to it. Maybe he wasn't believing in it anymore. And I think that's why they took him out. I think they had to had to have them have him eliminated. But that's just another theory. I wrote. I've I've got a book called Breathe, which which is a book of historical fiction where I I say John Lennon faked his death um, to get out of fame so we could go live the life he wanted to live and get away from it all. But. That's just, it's totally, no, it's not based off of anything. Yeah, but Lennon did drop a lot of clues. I mean, you know, in the yeah. Rolling Stone magazine, he mentioned, uh, he said Dylan was a myth, McCartney was a myth, the Beatles were a myth. And the song God on his first album, the yeah. uh, right, Plastic Ono Band, I don't believe in Beatles. Yeah. And he had gotten to the point where um, I think John had had it. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, Peter, when you live with that much deception, over time, it just, it has to wear on you. And it, it, you've got to get to a point where you think to yourself, I can't do this anymore. Sure. And, and how many times you, you got to wake up in the morning and think to yourself, is today the day I get found out? Oh yeah. Is today the day when somebody drops the dime on me? Yeah. You know, and I, I think that, uh, I think they got to that point. I, George Harrison as well, you know? And Ringo, you know, did interviews, two interviews where he talked about the songwriters. He didn't mention John or Paul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He called them the songwriters. Oh, I forgot to ask you um, the most important question of all. Did you say peace and love on July 7th at noon? No, I did not. Do you know about that? <laughs> no. But they... and Ringo Starr goes on Instagram and he says, everybody for my birthday at noon, say peace and love, peace and love. And the whole world's supposed to, you know think peaceful thoughts for two seconds so if it was Ringo or his double yeah yeah he he certainly has aged well for some of well I mean the thing is if you go back 10 years 15 years ago to some clips and uh, you look at him back then and you look at him now I mean it's jeez uh, he's he's getting younger and younger but I, <laughs> yeah. I, but, but I have a clip of um uh, uh Mike Campbell from um the heartbreakers and uh he was uh, openly discussing Ringo's double. Ringo sometimes sends a double. Oh, who yeah. Evident, who evidently, you know, the double evidently can play. So if Ringo can't make it, because, you know, Ringo's up in age now, he goes and sends his double. And um, Mike Campbell was saying, you know, he looks just like him, sounds just like him. Here, let me show you this picture. I think I sent this to you once, once before, but there's this yeah. picture. I saw this picture of Paul McCartney when I was like nine years old. Yeah, it's Billy, yeah. And I said, this is not Paul McCartney. I mean, the head's shaped differently. It's not. And even as a kid, I knew it wasn't, 
you know, Paul McCartney. And I used to have this picture in a scrapbook. Yeah. So Plus the he's whole, wearing a hairpiece. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It looks like a, a total little wig or something. But by yeah, the way, I, folks, Billy is blind in his right eye. Okay, yeah, so, you, you touched on that, didn't you? Where you think he, he had his eye taken out? Yeah. Uh, so he's so ritual. Yes. Yeah, so and we talk about clues about to compare or to uh, to prove that Billy is not biological Paul and biological Paul is not Billy. A lot of times we talk about Billy's face is longer. His ears are different. He has a higher, you know, forehead. He's taller. Uh, he's taller. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, another researcher, a colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, Sally Whitty, um, who is also blind in one eye. She has a uh, uh, an ocular prosthesis. She uh, realized that Billy, uh, he's blind in his right eye, and he has he has an artificial eye. Sees with his left, mm-hmm. and he's blind in his right. So that's a, that's a major. I think it's it's the clue of all clues mm-hmm. because uh, it, it clearly differentiates Billy from biological Paul. Because you know, if you t- look at Paul, his he had two. Perfectly fine eyes. Billy does not. And and the way you know is uh, Billy's two eyes on occasion will not sync up. They will not move uh, in Mm -hmm. alignment with each other. Yeah. Right. So that's that's how you know. And actually, folks, there's a on my um, Paul is Dead YouTube channel. If you go down to the um, playlist, you'll see a uh, a playlist for Billy's eye. And And I go through some slides where I show what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. um, about his eye and how it doesn't align and how it, it gets out of sync every once in a while. No, I think there's a lot of things out there that uh, are manipulating each and every one of us. And and fortunately, a few of us, you, like you and me, are awake to it. Um, but I am really, really grateful you came on here. I've been a big fan of yours for several years now. And I'm um, amazed by all the work and the effort you put into this. And uh, I really appreciate you being on tonight. Oh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for having uh, yeah. having me. It's been a great conversation. It's just it's great when it's freewheeling and we could just chat. That was Mike Williams, and I'm so glad we got a chance to talk today. I have been watching Mike for a couple of years on the internet, and he's just a very intelligent, well spoken, organized, passionate artist, and a believer of looking at life in a different way. Let's just put it that way, because I think there's a lot of things that they want us to think. And there's a lot of programming that goes into us as kids, through the media, through our schooling, through the government, that warps and shapes our mind. I think Mike is one person, help us out of the woods, so to speak. Well, not so to speak, out of the woods, literally. So Mike, thanks so much for coming on tonight. And uh, you can find Mike's work you can find his music at laboroflovemusic.com. You can find his podcast on sageofquay.com. You can also find it on YouTube. On uh, His channel is the same, same name. Look for Mike Williams or Sage of Quay on YouTube and you'll find him there. Thanks for watching PT Pop of Mind Revolution. And remember, all we have is each other. Take care. Bye.